accusations, not from Steve, but in a book by Michael Wolf. He's a sleazebag. Steve has to say whether or not he said these things. In just hours from now, President Trump will sit down with Senate Republicans to discuss DACA and border security. The Democrats are willing to sit down and make that deal. Uh, I think we'd be happy to get that done by the end of the month. Trump needs to be medicated and hospitalized, or he is going to just kill all of us. She has nothing of substance to offer in terms of criticism about the president. I think if anyone needs to be medicated, it should be her. Where are you going? Home. Home, he says. He's not going to stop for us, which I understand. We're in a blizzard. He's going home. I hope you make it, sir. Please stay safe. Gotta keep your head up, oh, and you can let your head down, hey. You gotta keep your head up, oh, and you can let your head down, hey. I know it's so well, keep your head up, even though it's a lousy weather day throughout the mid-Atlantic and the Northeast as well. Thanks for joining us on the world's number one cable morning news show, Fox and Friends. Some of you are enjoying the show in your bed. You didn't have to go to work today, didn't have to get the kids out. The silver lining. Right. That's true. Well, the problem is a lot of people go to bed, they overdress, and they end up waking up at 3 in the morning sweating as if they're in a sauna. What right? Is, How are they, they overdressed? Because you go to bed and you're cold, so right? and then you have so many covers on. So true. At 3 o'clock in the morning, you find yourself soaked, so and true. you have to have a whole change of clothing. And then you wake up with, like, pajamas everywhere exactly. in your bed because if I, hot. If I described your night of sleep, write me. You are, I, th- I think so you're describing true. your night of sleep. <laughs> well, we don't sleep enough to get sweaty. Yeah, but you're yeah. right about that. Oh, I have a story, and I'll just keep it to myself. Right, you have to. I do. I can totally relate to that. Because we got lots of news to talk about. This is a Fox News weather alert. A massive winter storm hammering the East Coast from the mid-Atlantic, dumping snow and unleashing winds that could be worse than Superstorm Sandy in some places right through New England. Hope with that the surge. More than 60 million people are in the storm's path, and more than 3,000 flights have already been canceled or delayed. All right, if you're thinking about hitting the road, think again. These are the conditions you could face. A treacherous commute in Ocean City, Maryland. Janice Dean uh, braved the storms here to go to the plaza, where the snow is falling outside. You know what? And by the end of the show, I might be able to do a snow angel here on the plaza. But come over here. Where are you from? Florida. And have you ever experienced a blizzard before? No. This is a first. What do you think of it so far? It's really cold. Oh, my gosh. And what are your names? And uh, give me the location. George of Florida. Ocala, Florida. And you want to say hi to anybody? Hi, Mom and Dad. Okay, hi, Mom and Dad. Hi, look, we're on TV. Well, listen, you're not driving anywhere, right? You're just walking. Okay, that's good. A uh, lot of folks need to be off the roadways. Real quick, I just want to show you where the storm is right now. Strengthening. It continues to strengthen. This actually might be one of the strongest storms we have ever experienced off the northeast coastline. This is a full-fledged blizzard. You can see the winds in excess of 40 miles per hour all along the coast, 30 miles here in New York City. We could see hurricane-force winds all along the coast, blizzard Blizzard warnings up for at least seven states. This storm is going to be out of here by this afternoon, but the problem is, look at the temperatures behind it. So bitter cold air, and the problem is we're going to see some power outages all along the coast, and that could be a problem as we head into the weekend because it's going to be record cold. All right, wave to any, everybody at home. You brave the w- blizzard of 2018. Bye. Bye. Right. Back uh, inside. Just the beginning. All right. Thanks, Janice. All right. Three minutes now after the hour. Uh, a lot of people weren't talking about what's happening outside. They were talking about what's happening inside. Inside the White House is uh, first uh, few months in office, six, uh, seven months in office. That's what Steve Bannon witnessed, and that's where he gave the bulk of his interviews to Michael Wolf. Many people say Michael Wolf's book, which is not released until next week, Fire and Fury, is really based on a lot of interviews with Steve Bannon and people that Steve Bannon urged right. to cooperate with him. Well, I was talking to somebody who's uh, in and out of the White House a lot these days, and uh, they were curious, uh, talked to him this morning, about why Steve Bannon had, or rather Michael Wolf had such access to the White House. As it turns out, we heard uh, from Sarah Huckabee Sanders say yesterday that they knew that uh, Mr. Wolf had visited about a dozen times. 95% of the times were to visit Steve Bannon. Now, this person also is quoted in the book, apparently, but they never spoke to the author. And so they wanted uh, us to know that take that with a grain of salt. So the person you talked to is quoted in the book, mm-hmm. but that person said they've never talked to this author. That's what so they say. The, over, did, yeah. the so, overall, 
Go is ahead. he saying that the, the quote that they used is inaccurate? Right. Called it fiction. Okay. Uh, they, the book basically shows the president as uninformed, thoroughly unserious candidate, and not engaged. In fact, only engaged to satisfy, satisfy his own ego. That usually comes from MSNBC and CNN or the other networks. This time it came from Steve Bannon, and those networks especially are loving the division at the top. All right, so here's the way I see it. This, this book about what's happening inside the White House, uh, Sarah Huckabee Sanders, said it's salacious, it's tabloid. Every administration has someone in the White House that leaves the White House. This guy happened to be fired from the White House. And then they do like this tell all of what happened inside. Do you believe it? I don't know. We, there was that author that was always on our show talking about what Hillary Clinton, what was happening in the White House when Bill Clinton was president, how she threw the vase across the room. You know, it's interesting to hear these things, but do you really believe it? Do you really care? Does it really affect your family? Well, yes. there's one thing to be said about the fact that Steve Bannon fact that Steve Bannon apparently reportedly told Michael Wolf these things about the presidency and uh, his family, all very salacious, uh, up until yesterday. And then last night, Steve Bannon, who hosts an, uh, an XM serious uh, radio show across the street, uh, he actually changed his tune. It could have been the cease and desist letter from the president's lawyer saying, hey, you signed a non-disclosure. You can't say anything bad about the president. And last night, after a caller asked him about the book, he didn't say anything bad about the president. Listen. The President of the United States is a great man. You know I support him day in and day out, whether going through the country given the Trump miracle speech or on the show or on the website. So I don't think you have to worry about that. But I appreciate the kind words. But what he does is uh, he says some disparaging things about the president's intellect, study habits, uh, and that's really where do, a lot of the damage is done. And the question is, would you back to what you were saying? I think people are interested. I'm always interested yeah. in what goes on in the White House, whether it's President Obama, President Clinton. I mean, I'll still uh, break out Nixon books to see if I can get a different perspective about what's happening. The question is, what does Steve Bannon get out of doing this? He loses his base of influence. The calls to the White House stop. The final financing of his candidate stops because the Mercers, some of the richest people in the country, a vital financier uh, and backer of President Trump, have made a decision. They're staying with President Trump. They have divorced themselves from Steve Bannon. Well, so now he's got what? Off, right, right. Bart and a radio show. Well, why would he do this, you wonder? I mean, the president said in a tweet that he's lost his mind. He did get fired. The president didn't bash him until Steve Bannon bashed him first. So. Right. Who knows? I mean, maybe he did lose his mind. Maybe he is crazy. I don't know. Well, Matt, Drudge, Matt Drudge says this is Steve Bannon is schizophrenic this morning. He says that basically he's got two personalities. Uh, John Pot Horitz writes in the uh, New York Post today that uh, Michael Wolff is a terrific writer. He re weaves solid reporting with errant speculation in his estimation. It's impossible to tell what's true from what's too good to be true. Uh, and we told the story about how in the book it says that the, the president never knew who John Boehner was, which is pretty funny. Michael Caputo, who was a campaign advisor, said this book not to be trusted. I stand with the president. This book by Michael Wolf is is just trash. The comments about, in particular, about Don Jr. in that meeting in Trump Tower in June of 2016, they were, you know, I thought I was really disturbed by those comments. I think that that causes grief for the president and this presidency uh, in the context of the ongoing Russia investigations. And uh, I don't blame the president one bit for going off like he did. Well, he's also had a cease and desist order because you signed a non-disclosure agreement to be in the White House. And obviously, if Steve Bannon cooperated, and he has not denied anything, you could say anything you want about Michael Wolff. But until Steve Bannon comes out and says, that's not what I said, there's yeah, no defending it. You're right. We learned that just journalism 101. Right. If someone says something that you've said and you didn't say it, you got to come out and you defend yourself. If not, the, the public's going to buy it and, and believe it. I'd love to talk to Michael Wolf on this couch, hopefully next week. That would be great. In the meantime, this week. while we're talking Tuesday. about yeah. this, book comes out Tuesday, uh, yeah. while we're talking about this, we're not talking about something that the president tweeted about yesterday, and that is the surging economy, the stock market going through the roof. And then you look at all these companies that are now giving bonuses, over 40 companies, uh, since they got the 
the tax cut, mm -hmm. which was signed by the president and okayed by the Congress, wow. it looks like some of the companies are giving bonuses up to $2,000. Some of them not just cash, but they're giving 401k matches, and they're spending millions and millions of dollars on charity. If you want wages to go up, uh, all these companies probably be looking to expand and hire, and then they're going to be competing for the talent. And the talent, of course, can walk around and say, now I have other options. Mm -hmm. That brings wages up naturally. Mm -hmm. You know, and it makes me want to buy from these companies. I mean, I, I don't work for Bank of America. I don't work for Aflac, you know, obviously. Aflac. But I still want to I want to support these companies because sure. they're helping their employees. They're giving back to them. It's Absolutely. Wonderful. And then for the employees who wind up with, let's say, they get $1,000 in their pocket uh, this week from the company, what are they going to do with that money? They're going to go. They're going to buy some new tires yeah. from, the, from the Firestone guy down the street. They're going to go uh, buy some pizza. The money's going to get injected directly into the bloodstream of the America's economy. So hats off to these 40 American companies giving bonuses. I'm up so to happy for those bucks. families. Think about that: a thousand dollars, two thousand dollars in their pockets. A tax cut and it's cash. Wonderful. In your head. Right. What about that cyclist in Maryland in the snow? He could get new tires and new brakes. He could buy a car. Maybe he could. Mm -hmm. you, maybe. <laughs> you never know. For a thousand bucks, it's well, going to be a great one. Be a start. Down payment. Exactly. <laughs> All right. It is 8:11 now here in New York City. Jillian's got some big news about that voter fraud commission. Yes, I do. Good morning to Good morning. you. To you at home as well. The president's controversial voter fraud commission has been dissolved. The executive order turning the issue over to the Department of Homeland Security. The project hit major roadblocks when multiple states refused to hand over data from the 2016 election. President Trump tweeting in part, quote, they fought hard that the commission not see their records or methods because they know that many people are voting illegally. System is rigged, must go to voter. ID. Well, the bone chilling cold and winter weather sweeping much of the nation, responsible for derailing an Amtrak train carrying 300 people overnight. A frozen switch caused three cars to slip off the tracks while pulling into a station in Savannah, Georgia. The train was able to continue on to New York City. No one was hurt. The Coast Guard searching for a plane that mysteriously vanished over the Gulf of Mexico. The single-engine plane took off from Wiley Post Airport in Oklahoma City, bound for another small airport near Austin, but never made it. This eerie flight path shows the plane heading past where it was supposed to land in Texas and straight out over the water. That's when the pilot stopped responding to air traffic control. Let's look at your headlines. And that's frightening when you, when you see the flight yeah. path and realize it didn't stop. I right. know it. The search Ooh. starts. All right, Jillian, thank Thanks, you. Thanks, Jillian. All right, uh, Senator Rand Paul applauding the Trump administration for halting wasteful aid to Pakistan. He's going to join Brian for a conversation next live. Plus, a man with a last name like my first, country music star Luke Bryan in big trouble for this Christmas present to his wife. Not a ring, not a puppy, but a kangaroo, a couple. And PETA is not happy. Put that in your pouch and smoke it. Beautiful home. Pouch and smoke it? Shake it for me, girl. Shake it for me, girl. Shake it for me. Somebody's sweet little farmer's child. They got a little blood to get a little wild. Ponytail and... President Trump making his message to Pakistan clear. This week tweeting this. The United States has foolishly given Pakistan more than $33 billion in aid in 15 years. And they have given us nothing but lies and deceit, thinking our leaders are fools. They give safe haven to the terrorists. We hunt in Afghanistan with little help. No more, exclamation point, close quote. Our next guest applauds this move in this tweet, saying the U.S. should not be sending money to countries that burn our flag. GOP Senator Rand Paul joins us. Uh, he's on the Foreign Relations Committee. And Senator, you may know that they stopped. They're not going to be spending, sending it over $100 million to Pakistan. That's already been decided. Pakistan says they're confused by this message. Are you confused? No, I've been advocating for this for years. I would take the money that we send to a lot of countries that aren't necessarily our friends, like Pakistan. I would redirect that money into building roads and bridges here. In fact, I have a bill that I will introduce next week that will take the about $2 billion we spend in Pakistan. Let's spend it in the United States. This is something that I've agreed with President Trump on for several years now. Let's spend some of that money here at home. Let's don't give it to people who hate us and burn our flag and chant death to America. So are are you worried about losing influence and opening up a door for maybe China to spread their influence inside that country and maybe we lose the binoculars on their nuclear program and, and weapons? 
I think one way you engage with people is through trade and interaction, and we can still have military arrangements with them, but uh, I'd like to see somebody who actually has money to buy our stuff rather than we give it to them. We give everything to Pakistan, and there are rumors that uh, the Pakistani intelligence actually cooperate with a Haqqani network that kills our soldiers. So I think it's a real disservice. I know a lot of these young men and women. Some of them are in my family. I think it's a real disservice to them to give money to a government that may be cooperating with people who are killing our soldiers. So, no, uh, Pakistan at best is a frenemy, but uh, they have not been behaving. Look, bin Laden lived in their country for a decade. They did nothing about it. They have Christians they've incarcerated. The doctor that helped us get information to get bin Laden when we finally captured him, he's in jail for 33 years from the Pakistani government. So, no, they're not really our friend. Yeah, they summoned our ambassador. So I think the president's not backing off on this. Now, let's look, let's look elsewhere around. The president also said, I'm looking at the Palestinian Authority. They don't want to sit down and talk with us. We're giving them money. I'm going to revisit that. Among the people that don't want the president to sit, sit back for now are the Israelis. They say, listen, we don't want uh, unrest in Gaza. We don't want mass, uh, you know, a humanitarian <laughs> crisis in that area. What's your reaction? Well, you know, I introduced a bill about a year ago to cut off the Palestinian Authority's aid. And here's the interesting thing. Israel does complain because we're paying for it. Let Israel pay for it. If Israel thinks the Palestinian Authority ought to get money, let's see if they can pass that to the Knesset. So we, we end up giving all the money to the Palestinian Authority. and They preach hatred of Israel. And then Israel says, oh, we need to keep giving money to the Palestinian Authority. No, I'd cut it all off. We don't have any money. We're $700 billion in the hole. Why are we giving? the money to the Palestinian Authority. If Israel wants to cooperate with the Palestinian Authority and thinks that they should get money, they should vote for it. You know, the average uh, living standard for the average Israeli is greater than the average American. They've right. got money. They should pay the Palestinian Senator, Authority, but I wouldn't give Palestinian Authority any money. Senator, I know you've kind of tied with the president. Are you guys on the same page as this? You just happen to agree on this from afar. Have you been speaking to him? You know, I talked to him this week about the Palestinian thing, and I've also been in favor of building infrastructure and a real rub of how we build infrastructure. He's wanted to do a trillion dollars worth of infrastructure is where do you get the money? You know, we're already 700 billion in the hole. Foreign aid and aid to Pakistan won't pay for all of it, but the last 15 years you mentioned, we've spent over $30 billion in Pakistan. That's quite a few bridges. We have a bridge in between Kentucky right. and Ohio that we've wanted, would cost about a half a billion. All right. That We could have easily built that with some of that money we sent to Pakistan. Always good to see you, Senator Paul. Thanks so much. When we Thank come you. back, we talk about unemployment, the economy, and more. This is Fox & Friends. We are back with a Fox News uh, extreme weather alert and a live look at the snow-covered boardwalk in Seaside Heights, New Jersey, courtesy of EarthCam. The beach town on the path of the monster storm, uh, in the monster storm, unleashing snow, ice, and hurricane force winds at this hour. And further down the Jersey Shore, we find Steve Keeley for our Fox affiliate, uh, Fox 29. He's live in Atlantic City. We assume, Steve, I don't recognize anything. Uh, Brian, I, as dangerous as it is out here in these blizzard conditions, my concern is more for you. Uh, wondering if you're getting too toasty in that vest. <laughs> I heard you talk about being overdressed ah, and feeling ah, like you're in a sauna. Right. Uh, Steve's got the jacket unbuttoned, but I don't want you getting overheated in that studio on that nice warm You're worried couch. about it. Okay That's very kind, sure? Steve. There you go. How's Atlantic City? All right, thank you. By the way, Janice Dean. Uh, well, you can see, I think, uh, it's not too good right now, and it's getting worse by the minute. The winds are picking up, gust up to 60. Uh, now they've upped the forecast on the snow as well to a foot and a half, but as you can see at the uh, foot or feet of my camera guy, because of the high winds, it's already drifting up to three feet in spots. Look at this. So I think we already hit the forecast level in this spot, uh, but that's courtesy of these high winds. And then we also got high waves uh, now flooding the streets. And the problem is, uh, not just here, but all around the country, we're suffering these dangerous wind chills. Uh, we're going to have wind chills for at least three days after this, well below zero. And yesterday we were showing how salt water, yes, it can, despite having salt in it, freeze. So when we have the salt water filling the streets, it's going to be uh, ice filling the streets. So more treacherous conditions to follow uh, the blizzard conditions. So a whole host of problems, plus we've got power starting to get 
knocked out as the wind uh, takes my breath away. Uh, we've got over a thousand people without power already because the winds are tearing down uh, the power lines and the trees above them uh, taking down the line. So a whole bunch of problems and I guess we can't complain because Erie had five feet of snow so I'm standing in two feet of snow. Uh, by the way, I just want you guys to know you're not the only one uh, with a comfortable white couch. I've got one here as well. Oh, so boy. I'll send it from my couch <laughs> back to you guys on your white couch. How you, about that? You're going to regret that later. Just saying, when you get a little soaking wet standing out in zero degree weather. Steve Keeley, who's dressed for the day along with his camera guy, thank you very much. All right. Steve, use some moisturizer. Don't be a fool. <laughs> it made for good TV, though, and that's all we care about, right, Steve and Brian? Thanks so much. It is an all-out wage war up in Canada. A new report finds minimum wage hikes across Canada could cost its economy close to 60,000 jobs by next year. So with many states and cities raising their minimum wages here in the United States, will the economic impact be as negative as, it, as they've seen in Canada? Time now for the Massey Memo with Fox News legal analyst and host of The Property Man. Bob Massey. Hey, Bob, great to see you. Good morning, Ainsley. Thank you. All right, so if you look at minimum wage hikes, it seems like that would be great for the minimum wage mm -hmm. employer. Employees, the small business guy, yes. not so much. How does it affect the economy, good or bad? You know, this wage increase has been around for many years, Ainsley, and obviously if you raise it up to what they're talking about, $15 an hour, that could be devastating to businesses because ultimately it's going to happen. They're waiting for this tax reform now to help them grow their business. With that kind of increase, there's no question there will be a reduction in staff, and ultimately you're going to have people that are going to be affected. It's going to affect bonuses, raises, and things like that. So in the long run, although we understand that you want to be able to give people more money to be able to stimulate the economy, if businesses have to pay that kind of money, and I represent a lot of businesses like that, they said it's going to devastate their business. Really? So businesses won't be able to grow with wage hikes? Yeah, I mean, ultimately, you have to figure, let's say you have, a, like I represent a restaurant in town has 75 employees. So now let's say they increase it to $15. And remember, those employees also, their servers and things like that, they're getting tips. How are they going to possibly pay that minimum wage, grow their business, increase their service? It's not going to happen. And the one thing that concerns me, that I'm concerned that it actually could make people, make owners cheat. And what do I mean by that? I mean, they may pay people under the table cash. Because of the fact that they can't afford the minimum wage, they'll say, listen, I'm going to pay you cash to stay here because I cannot afford it. And because people need jobs, they will do that. So uh, there's really some concerns that I have if this goes down. And by the way, the state should handle this, not the feds. I was going to say, if you force someone to do it, that's not a good thing. If they decide, then, hey, that's, that's okay, course. right? What about, um, you always well, talk certainly. about, of you're course. the property man, you always talk about buying houses. Is it going to help? <laughs> will it help? Wage hikes, I would think, would encourage more people to buy houses. Yeah, that's true. And there's, I read a couple articles about this. The problem is what happens to those people that who loses their jobs? Now, if they lose their job because of the pay hike, because there had to be reduction in the amount of people working, that's going to affect the economy from the perspective they won't have the money to buy cars, buy houses, buy consumer goods every week. So this is a real balancing act. And it has to be looked at where we care about the employee and their ability to buy, but also the employer's ability to be able to grow and give bonuses and raises and benefits and pensions. And that's what you have to be careful of with this increase in minimum wage. Okay, we'll leave it with your Massey memo. What is it today? Balancing act. Everything has to go on its own, and you have to be concerned that ultimately the growth of the business can be stifled. Okay. Property Man airs on FBN, Fox Business Network, on Friday nights at 8.30 p.m. Thanks, Bob. Great to see you. Thanks, Ainsley. You're Thank welcome. you. Well, they say violence is necessary. So why is one of the top guys at the DNC promoting the Antifa movement? Plus, the president firing back at Steve Bannon for trash-talking his family, threatening even a lawsuit now. Anthony Scaramucci, what does he think? We're going to ask him. He's going to join us live next.
we've been getting ready for Anthony Scaramucci, former guy who uh, worked in the White House, communications director. Former we, guy. We he currently stole a guy. He's, he's, still, he's still old, old man. man. He's still a guy. Yeah. Well, we sent a dog sled out. Thanks for All making right. it today. No, great. Great to be here. All right, so I'm, I'm loving the vest. I know, right? It's fantastic. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, but don't make Steve feel bad. Comment on something no, no, Steve's no, no, wearing. No, Steve looks great, but the vest is saying something about how you grew up. Anthony, top story on you know, every network. Everyone's talking about this book that mm -hmm. Michael Wolf wrote and talked about Steve Bannon saying all kinds of salacious bad things about the president's family when he was working at the White House. What is this true? Listen, I don't know if it's true, but what I what I what I would suggest to people, because what goes on in the industry now is people just say whatever they say. Uh, let's go verify it. OK. Uh, at the end of the day, some of it may be true. Some of it may not be true. Uh, but I have to say this. If he did say it. He should get out there and walk it back. So he's got two choices. I'm not his communications director or his strategist. But if I were, I'd say, walk it back. Donald J. Trump is not treasonous. He's an American patriot. He loves his dad and he loves his country. So walk it back uh, if he did say it. And if you didn't say it, then you got to go out there and denounce uh, that you didn't say it. One so or the other. What he's talking about Donald Trump Jr., basically he said that he is going to crack like an egg and, there, and the Mueller is going to focus on money laundering and predicted uh, that's going to be on all on, on national television. Okay, so, so again, I don't know if he said that, Brian, or he didn't say it, but let me just say this. It's been, it's been a not, few hours it's been okay, out and he so, hasn't walked it back. Okay, so he's not going to crack like an egg. He's got nothing to crack about. He's an extremely honest person. I'd put all my money on the table. Okay, you guys remember John Corzine? He was the governor of, sure. of, of New Jersey. Uh, he had a scandal with MF Global. It wasn't really a scandal. It was when just was a bad. It, it, it was a bad trade. No, he was at MF Global, the CEO. Oh, right. Everybody on CNBC, all around, said he was a criminal. He stole the money. I got out on the air. I said he's not a criminal. He may not like his politics, but he's not a criminal. He didn't steal one dollar. Sure. Okay. Donald J. Trump Jr. is a very honest person. I have no problem standing up for the guy. I have no problem sticking up for the family. These are very good people that love the country. And so I think Steve's made a very big mistake, if he said it. Anthony, uh, let's ask you a little bit about this. Uh, apparently, uh, Mr. Wolf had pretty good access to the White House because 95% of his uh, dozen visits there, he was at the, get, the guest of Steve Bannon. Uh, well, the in, my, in my 11 days, I didn't see him there. Okay, you didn't see him during but your 11 days. It was also 954,000 seconds, if you were counting the seconds, Brian, but go ahead. <laughs> but they also apparently, according to Axios, uh, he met... Michael Wolf did uh, some of the sources across the street over at the Hay Adams. Here's a question regarding Steve Bannon, that he would say these things, because he represents essentially Donald Trump's core base audience. Why would Steve Bannon take a shot at the president like this? Well, listen, you know, the, the president put out a pretty forceful statement yesterday, which I know you guys read. He said he's crazy. Steve, uh, and he also said he's about Steve. You know, six months ago, I said that. I said he's there building his own brand. He's about Steve. Again, I would say to Steve Bannon, if he's listening to your show, why don't you drop the nonsense, apologize to everybody, and rejoin the team? Okay, I don't know what jersey you're wearing, but you're not wearing our jersey, and you're not wearing Team America's jersey. Okay? Well, at the end of the day, the president's trying to bring the country together. He's got to work with establishment Republicans and establishment Democrats, which he's trying to do. You're distracting from that agenda. Be a team player and knock it off. He doesn't read a briefing book. He doesn't read a memo. When he talked about the Constitution, wouldn't focus. What, what's the person Nonsense. that you... Okay. So, look, well, you I saw get... him during the campaign. Okay, first of all, the guy's a wickedly smart guy. I'll use a neighborhood expression, okay? Number two, you don't become the President of the United States if you're not a wickedly smart person. Bill Clinton said that about George W. Bush. They were picking on George W. Bush and his intelligence and his syntax. And Bill Clinton said, time out a second. You don't become president if you're not a wickedly smart person. Mm -hmm. You probably didn't say it just like that, but I'm saying it like that. True or false, so, he so, didn't so, want to become president. They say okay, he did okay, not want to okay, become Brian, president. Have was you, to make himself have you more had famous. dinner in the residence with me and the president? Yes. Did the guy not want to become president? Absolutely okay, it's was. absolutely ridiculous. Okay, I was on the campaign. with This guy left everything on the field. He emptied the tank on the campaign. Let's go back to 24 hours before the election when he was sitting there in Pennsylvania telling the staff who were thinking they were going back to LaGuardia Airport that we're flying up to Michigan at 1 o'clock in the morning. Mm. Unbelievable campaign uh, event in Michigan, okay, bringing the base out, and he won Michigan. How many times did Secretary Clinton go to Michigan? I don't think ever. A few. No, she won a few, but Wisconsin, zero. My point is, actually, she went once, right after the president. went. She brought President Obama, First Lady uh, Obama, and, uh, and President Clinton. But my point is, the guy left everything on the field. He wanted to win more than anybody. And let's face it, he's a winner. 
Okay, he started in June. Well, I'm just 15, talking about what the insiders months. are saying. Well, it's nonsense. Spent, it's nonsense. This is why. But how much of his own some money? Some of it. I think it was president? probably 55, 60 million. I, I, I don't, do I don't, I don't know the exact number, but it is total nonsense, okay? Right. Ask Kellyanne Conway that was on the air sure. six, seven times a day. This is total right, nonsense. Is Steve... so, so I already know that part of the book is factually inaccurate the, just the, by that. The New Yorker magazine this guy says, wanted to be the president. In, the, in the excerpts in the New Yorker magazines, when the Mercers came in and said, I want to use Steve Bannon and I want to give five million to the campaign, mm -hmm. the president's retort was, why? Mm -hmm. Is that true? When the Mercers came in, the oh, president okay, asked the okay. Mercers why okay, so, they want to help so, them? So, again, I believe that it's total nonsense, but I wasn't in the conversation, sure. okay? This, so he, you're not he, you guys die. know the president. He's gregarious. He's sarcastic. You know, he, he has a tendency to be flamboyant with his rhetorical flourishes, as some of us do. Big deal. Yeah. He, he, but here's what I would say to Steve Bannon. Again, uh, you're losing your access to the White House because Lost of the way, you're, the way you're running your mouth. And you're losing your access to the Mercers, okay, the way you're running your mouth. So why don't you stop running your mouth and get to a good life coach mm. and right, knock so what, off the what, nonsense? What is Bannon That's what like? I what's Bannon like behind the scenes? Why did he get fired specifically? And a, what's his personality he's a, he's like? A, he's a very smart person. Mm -hmm. He's a very good writer. Uh, he does have a pulse on what's going on in some level of the economic discontent and desperation in our society. And that I think him and the president had common interests with. But the notion that the president needs him for his base, I soundly reject that. The president has his own base. Mm. My prediction is that even Breitbart will break from Bannon if he doesn't drop the nonsense and come back into the fold. Speaking Cut of it out. coming back into the fold, I think we all saw your name in the news in the last week. Maybe you're thinking about going back to the I, White House? I, okay, so I have never said that. Um, I'll say it on the record here. Uh, I've never had a conversation with the president about that or his family. I view the president as a, uh, a, a friend. Uh, we talk. Uh, I, I wish him a happy new year on New Year's Eve. He's, a, he's, you know, he's been a good friend to me. Because I got fired uh, because of what happened with my interview and General Kelly's decision to fire me, I'm not breaking ranks from the president. He's got an unbelievable agenda for the American people. The economy's growing. Wages are up for middle class and lower, lower class families. He's going to tackle these national security issues better than anybody else that we could have put in that job. And so I'm not breaking with so the president. Gonna... By the way, by the way, he's a friend of mine. I'm focused on my house, not the White House. What are okay? you doing now? What am I doing? I'm waiting for my deal to close. Unfortunately, my deal needs CFIUS approval. I sold my business to H&A, uh, um, and it's taking a little while longer. But there's no, in my opinion, there's no national security reason why my deal can't close. And so hopefully we'll hear mm -hmm. about that in the first quarter. That deal closing. Sure. And then I'll sit on the couch with you guys Is all day. Is there something that you did that would prevent you from going back to the White House? Because I know you want to serve the country. You, you looked at two different, two or three different positions. And if you're in radio conversation and he trusts you, why wouldn't you consider going back? Or why wouldn't they no, consider no, no, bringing you back? I didn't say I wouldn't consider it. I'm an American patriot. I do anything the president would ask me to do. But I'm not a presumptuous guy where I've ever said to anybody, oh, the president wants me back in the White House. It's a bunch of nonsense. You know what happens right. is you're an effective surrogate for the president. You're an effective right. advocate. Someone's trying to hit you and trying to create a bridge between you and a divide between you and the president and his family. That's not going to happen with me. You said you spoke to that reporter off the record. It ended up costing you your job I, in the White I House. I spoke to the reporter off the record. His family had a 50-year relationship with my family. Wow. He can pretend that he didn't, uh, but the Lizza family and the Scaramucci's on Long Island go back 50 years, uh -huh. and so he can say whatever he wants. But listen, he lost his job, and so he's not going to be able to do what he did to me, to other people, thank God. Mm -hmm. uh, but I made a mistake, and Ainsley, I own the mistake. Mm -hmm. I didn't. I never walked you think it back. Steve Bannon feels like it was a mistake to talk to this reporter. I don't know. I hope he does. I hope he does. And if he does, I hope he, he'll, he'll do the necessary and right thing: is to either offer an apology or issue a retraction, That's one right. or the other. Steve Scaramucci, tried to get great, him on the show. Great, great yeah. to see you guys. Yeah. Thank you. You didn't want to come on the show? Yeah, he declined our invitation. Okay. All right. Well, maybe ask tomorrow. Him, ask him again. All right. Thank you, Anthony. Good right. advice. Good That's very good, good advice. Good, Unpaid good, advisor. Good seeing. Yeah. I'm, I'm not a great communication strategist, but I'm trying to.